Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I uh, have been invited by the executive committee to present a webinar about hormone sparing surgery. But before that, I first want to thank the committee for inviting me and also thank the, the committee under leadership of President Amit Singh uh, in how they have really been able to um, create community, a community spirit during this crisis. Uh, and I, I, I have certainly uh, appreciated that. Uh, but that said, uh, here we go. We're going to start talking about hormone sparing uh, surgeries. I'm going to put myself up here in the corner. Here we go. All right. So more specifically, the hormone uh, sparing surgeries that I am going to talk about is the hysterectomy in the female dogs and the vasectomy in the male dogs. And the all overshadowing a shadowing question when we're talking about these alternative procedure is usually why. It's much less of a how than what it is of why. We do, we have experience of spay and neuter procedures and all their advantages for decades and decades. So why would we even consider an alternative? And uh, this, this audience doesn't need a discussion on the benefits of spay and neuter but uh, I just wanted to summarize them for our discussion. And we do know that we have an advantage on population control. Uh, we have an advantage on lifestyle and that is not only the owner, uh, even though the, the owner advantages of having a desex dog are, it's, uh, and the handling of that dog is, is much simplified than, than having intact dogs with sexual behaviors. Uh, but it's also a matter of lifestyle for the dog because we know that dogs are more relinquished uh, to shelters. Um, the, uh, the, the more uh, the neutered dogs are less likely to be relinquished. That was hard to get out. <laughs> All right, we also know that we have some, some true and clear medical advantages of spaying and neutering dogs and it may be particularly in female dogs because some of that reproductive disease is incredibly common in them. We're talking about memory tumor incidence of 13% of dogs before the age of 10 will develop memory tumors. And even more, 19% uh, will develop pyometra. And if you're looking at both diseases, so will an animal get one or the other of these two diseases, it's almost a third of the intact female population that will be affected before the age of 10. Uh, male dogs, it's not uh, quite as clear because I haven't seen studies that are quite as clear, but extrapolating from other epidemiological studies, it seems like males are, uh, are affected by reproductive disease in about 10% of dogs, and that's double digits. Those are huge disease incidences. So why then would we consider doing something else than gonadectomy? Well, there is an accumulated evidence base that has uh, actually accumulated for decades, uh, not necessarily in the veterinary literature um, and uh, also uh, sort of uh, not really been brought forward to our attention uh, until the last uh, more recent years. But if you're looking back at uh, the better studies that I have listed here, and I listed them just with a uh, first author for space, uh, uh, space uh, reasons, uh, you're looking at prostatic carcinoma, it's pretty clear that we are seeing increased incidence and that uh, risk is four to eight times that of an intact dog. And not only the uh, risk overall, but it tends to be nastier cancer in the castrated dogs. Osteosarcoma, about uh, two to three, up to maybe close to four times as common as in um, the uh, intact population. Hemangiosarcoma, uh, especially seems to be a disease affecting uh, the uh, spayed female dogs with uh, depending on breed, depending on sub, uh, sub uh, population uh, is uh, up to eight, nine times that of intact dogs. Joint disease is also definitely brought forward um, and I'm not going to talk tons about that because that is usually not my, uh, what I feel is the reason to go forward. It's more the cancers that I focus on. And then to add uh, to the plethora of disorders, uh, more recently there has been a couple of studies looking at immune disorders and seeing them 
uh, overrepresented in the gonadectomized animals. But I'm also saying that this is not clear cut. It's still very controversial. Uh, I think most surgeons or most veterinarians, uh, we get sort of horrified uh, at the thought of leaving ovaries behind because we uh, would be expecting a stump plimetra just uh, like we see with the ovarian remnant syndrome. Uh, all the other hormone, uh, hormone, hormone responsive diseases that we have uh, touched base briefly, uh, what are we doing with them? Uh, we also have some conflicting uh, literature out there, uh, starting to looking at these figures and, and uh, criticizing the covariant analysis and maybe thinking that the gonadectomy maybe is not as important as has been reported. Uh, we uh, also have the overall information of overall life expectancy is higher. They live longer if they're neutered because um, most so in that study it's driven by that young uh, non spay neuter animals have a, are more uh, likely to die in, in trauma, but still. So considering, if you're considering doing this, uh, I think it's pretty clear, at least I feel like this, is that we are not necessarily treating the animal, we are actually treating the, the owner, because I give all of them the option to just simply keep their animal uh, um, intact, and not do any surgery but they are here because they want to be responsible, they want to have the dog desexed, and they don't want to take the risk to, uh, for unwanted pregnancies. So there are highly responsible owners, they're usually highly educated owners at the same time, and they tend to be very concerned. And I've had several owners that have experiences of having their animals dying in these pretty nasty cancers at the reasonably young age, and it's really hard to, for me to tell them that they shouldn't worry and just go ahead. And I think if, if they were to have uh, their animal being, being affected by these cancers, they would kick themselves. Uh, so I, I, I feel that there is a, a case for considering alternative procedures for these owners. They also need to be responsible because uh, to manage an, uh, uh, an alternatively uh, sterilized dog is, is taking some management and, and some uh, you need to uh, you know, be a responsible owner in other ways as well. But um, there is no evidence um, and, uh, uh, about outcome. We don't know uh, really, uh, we don't have any evidence to lean on to say that the, we are not doing harm. So, uh, and I think all of us want to feel like we're fulfilling the Hippocratic Oath about not causing harm. So I'm gonna present a little bit of figures down the road in this talk uh, that I have started accumulating here. But that said, I just wanted to stress on that uh, since we have no evidence, I think it's very important to educate the owner. And this is actually a photos taken of these owners that they put out on Facebook on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Facebook page for these type of procedures. Uh, and it's showing me doing that owner education and their dog seems to be quite interested. Um, the, uh, I always make sure that we have an informed consent. I have a special form that I have them sign so that there can be no question uh, down the road is that they heard about all these uh, potential risks. So that said, let's go and talk about the surgeon instead. Uh, so starting with a the hysterectomy, there are some anatomical things that I need to draw your attention to. And looking on the left side image here first, the first thing I wanted to point out to you is that this, uh, how the proximity of the, the cranial uh, uterine horn to the ovary, they are really close together. There is not a lot of distance between them here. Uh, and this is the view that we will be seeing because this is the medial view of the, uh, of the ovary. And um, uh, we're gonna look at some landmarks here too. Uh, let's, let's bop over to this, uh, this side here first. This is showing the uh, anatomical uh, arrangement of this area here, the cervix. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody are on the same page in that the cervix is extremely angled in the female dog. And that means that the endometrium, the productive lining is actually sort of draping over a pretty big part of the cervix. And at least we, when we teach our students, we're teaching them to tie over the cervix um, and when they're doing their ligation. And if you do that, there is a, a, a risk that you're leaving uh, uh, endometrium behind. And that's not acceptable when you're doing uh, uh, ovary sparing surgery. So I always ligate, as you're gonna see on the vaginal side. Um, 
over to the landmarks that I was talking about. If you guys remember this little structure here, that's the little slit in the peritoneal lining uh, where the ovarian bursa is communicating with the peritoneal cavity. Uh, and it's located, it's a good landmark because it's right smack, uh, right over the ovary. And also it has that, the, uh, when you're touching it or, or when you're manipulating it, you can often see this fimbria of the oviduct. Uh, it's an, it's nicely visible. It's sort of that redder uh, or, or darker pink uh, color. So I'll come back to that in, in the videos a little bit. Good landmark. All right, so let's talk about the surgery. The one uh, concern that I have is that I think that the cervix uh, needs to be exteriorized. I do all of these as, as laparoscopy assisted. I just find that it's uh, for efficacy that that is, uh, is the way to go. Um, but to get the cervix, nicely exteriorized without tension, uh, you need to have the lap assist uh, uh, incision very caudal. And I have noted that when they're juvenile, they are, uh, the cervix is so caudally located that it's really hard to exteriorize, even if you're really close to the pubic rim. So uh, I have put an age limit of, I need them older than six months if I'm gonna do an ovary sparing spay. And I tend to do them multi-port and I, I find that it's sort of a little bit crowded back there in the very caudal uh, abdomen. So I, I think it would be hard to do a, a single port approach here, but maybe uh, some of you can prove me wrong. Okay, or setup is just like an ovaryectomy. Uh, portals is just almost just like an ovaryectomy. I tend to move this caudal portal as caudal as I possibly can because that will become my lap assist uh, portal. Um, okay, so let's look at a little video. We're on the left uh, ovary here and uh, we are gonna lift it up and uh, I'm gonna, want, I like to hold on, grasp it right in that slit. And can you see those fimbria that I was talking about, that little redder? That gives me nice, uh, nice uh, access to the entire uh, area here with the, over the proper ligament. And then I go as close to the ovary as I, as I feel like I can. Uh, and I often end up within the bursa uh, of the ovary. And it's all because I'm so concerned about leaving uh, endometrium behind. And then I just keep on going all the way down to this clear window that we often tell the, uh, the students to, uh, to do their ligation in. And when I'm done here, I'm done. Uh, the rest of it, uh, the, the broad ligament, I'm gonna disrupt by traction. And then uh, in addition, also maybe some cautery on the on the, um, when it's exteriorized. And as you can see, I often use uh, electrocautery because there are no huge vessels here. So I feel that that is quite adequate. And I have a hard time with costs here at my institution with uh, the vessel sealing devices. So uh, that's why I do that. I must admit, I, nowadays I usually use my uh, scissors and hook, uh, hook the cautery cord to that instead, just to be a little bit more effective. Oops. All right, uh, so after you have taken down uh, both uh, 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 mesovariums and split off the uh, ovarium, uh, then you are just simply exteriorized, just when you used to do uh, lap-assisted ovarian hysterectomies, and then just making sure you get the entire uh, cervix out and you will like it over here, over caudal to it. And this is uh, this dog I just wanted to show that after I have done that, I have cut this open and we're looking at the, the cervix. And this is the part that protrudes into the vagina. Um, and this I have split open the uterine body. And you can see the endometrial lining going all the way back to here. And there is really truly only a few millimeters. You can see the magnification of the instruments. You can, there's very short distance to where you actually are cutting, um, which is a little bit unnerving. Um, for vasectomies, I still like to use my vessel sealing device, uh, if, uh, if at all possible. Uh, on a couple of really cost-sensitive uh, owners, I have been using electrocautery, and I feel that there is precedence because there is a laparoscopic vasectomy uh, experimental study done many years back that used that for a series of five dogs, and they didn't see any complications. So um, I, I think it's appropriate. Um, yeah, let's, let's leave it at that. Uh, okay, so setup is very similar to the ovaryectomy. We're working caudally, so we would like to have our screen more caudally. 
And this is a two portal technique. Uh, you can put both of them on midline or you can have your instrument portal off to one or the other side if you would prefer. Uh, I like to combine it with a, a suture grasper device, which is needlescopic. So you push this needle in and get this little grasper out. Uh, mine uh, is bought from the Progressive Medical, but it's very similar to what's depicted here. For the vasectomies, I like to approach it uh, uh, in this area. Here we have the bladder nicely uh, 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 located and uh, we have a colon. So a little bit busy, a little bit uh, an area where you like to work on the area that is nicely visible and accessible. Uh, and I like to stay away from the testicular vessel so that I not inadvertently are causing any venous stasis or something like that. So this is where I'm gonna approach and I'm gonna take about a centimeter of this structure out. And here comes a video depicting that. Here comes my grasper device. Uh, we, it goes to pick up the, the uh, structure. The person who's doing it is a little bit uh, mirrored, so it looks a bit clumsy here, but um, taking one centimeter of it out, it's quick. This surgery is often combined with like a gastropexy or something, but uh, the vasectomy itself is like done in, it's a matter of minutes. Oops. Uh, all right, post-operative recovery, nothing new for us that are doing these surgeries, uh, the spay neuter surgeries. Uh, for hysterectomy, we are fairly remote, so I would like, I often like to keep them just for monitoring, but uh, six to 18 hours is definitely enough. Uh, vasectomy is, I um, have no qualms doing them on an outpatient basis. So it's often the other surgeries that we're doing concurrently that is uh, dictating the, the monitoring. For these surgeries alone, uh, they should require only NSAID analgesia and only for a few days. Do I need to point out that I'm giving opioids in the pre-meds? They get opioids perioperative, but it's the post-operative anal analgesia that I do uh, NSAIDs alone. Okay. Uh, for the hysterectomy, I just want to present what figures I do have at this, uh, at this current time. And I uh, did structured follow up on 17 uh, female dogs with hysterectomy of a plethora of different breeds. They were on average about a year and a half old. Uh, and we, the average follow up was uh, close to three years. And out of them, only one had been ovariectomized, and that was not due to a medical condition. It was due to convenience because they also had an intact male dog and it was inconvenient to have both intact. Uh, other outcome data is that uh, four of the dogs were still having some uh, level of vaginal discharge when they had, when, during heat. They didn't have hemorrhagic discharge, but they did have clear to serosanguinous discharge. Uh, and it was mild. The behavior, many of them commented on the behavior uh, uh, saying that they changed and that uh, behavior changes during heat, they ranged all from just being vaguely different all the way up to one dog being flat out aggressive during heat. They did develop some medical conditions, but nothing that I feel has any, uh, uh, that seems to be related to sex hormones. Um, and two of the owners were admittedly unsure if they would do it again with all the cons of keeping them intact. And then over to the vasectomy, I only had eight of those because I do them very sparingly. Uh, and uh, they were uh, from an, a variety of, of uh, breeds and they were on average approximately two years old and we follow them up similarly a little bit more than three years. Uh, and out of them, surprisingly to me, m the, the majority, uh, five of them had later been castrated and it was all due to behavioral uh, reasons. Um, and when, when we tried to uh, wheedle out which type of behaviors, they seemed to be uh, more towards the aggressive, obnoxious, dog aggressive, you know, all of that uh, sort of behaviors that I suspect that many of them were actually more just regular sexual behaviors of a male dog. Um, one of them had developed asymmetric testes and my guess is that it's a sperm granuloma, but I can't of course not prove that. And one of them had developed what they, what they felt was night terrors. So vocalizing um, intermittently at night and that disappeared after castration. So what that was, I don't know, but of course we cannot rule out that it was some, uh, some pain associated with it. Sporing granuloma, who knows? Uh, so in conclusion, 
Um, from a medical standpoint, hysterectomy appears to be safe uh, and fairly well tolerated. Uh, the vasectomy, on the other hand, uh, seemed poorly tolerated, and maybe it's just our clientele, but uh, uh, they, uh, despite intense owner education, they were not prepared for what an intact male dog is like to own. And uh, I just think that the owner education is so important uh, and also to cover our own butts to get that owner education done and documented. So with that, I wanted to say thank you uh, for your attention. And I think I will be live chatting probably uh, at the same time as this is going on. So uh, please uh, let those figures be coming. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and uh, that's it. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Lux. And um, at this point, we can just go ahead and get started. So um, since there's a variety of different people on this call, I wanted to make sure that we started out with a definition. So ovarian remnant syndrome is a gynecologic condition defined as the presence of a pelvic mass with residual ovarian tissue after previous ovariectomy. And this picture on the bottom right is a very typical image of what we might find in one of our canine patients, where you can see that there is some ovarian tissue embedded in this fat um, in this dog. So as you may have um, guessed from the definition, this is not just a veterinary problem. This is a relatively recent review from 2012 out of the current opinion of obstetrics and gynecology outlining the syndrome in humans. However, some things to be aware of are that while iatrogenic ovarian remnant syndrome does occur in human medicine, our human surgeon counterparts are often dealing with considerable pelvic adhesions due to repeated inflammatory conditions leading to fibrotic adhesions. Conditions such as endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and previous abdominal surgery are common in women whereas we generally do not account for this or encounter this in veterinary medicine. Additionally, both ectopic and neovascularized ovaries have been reported in human medicine. Essentially in veterinary medicine, the only realistic reported cause of ovarian remnant syndrome in the dog is improper surgical technique and failure to remove the ovary at the time of OVE or OVH. There are anecdotal reports of accessory or ectopic ovarian tissue or the neovascularization of ovarian tissue. However, this does not play out when looking at peer reviewed literature. Clinical signs that dogs often present for are the typical signs of estrus. So one of the ones that we think of that's very visual is this idea of vulvar enlargement. So these are two female spayed yellow Labrador retrievers. The one on the left hand side is under the influence of estrogen, whereas the one on the right hand side is a more typical appearance of what we would assume a spayed, spayed female vulvar would appear. We can also see mammary gland enlargement, serosanguinous vaginal discharge, a willingness to breed, and a, uh, an attraction of male intact dogs. Ovarian remnant syndrome may occur months to years after ovariectomy, and in fact has been reported just as soon as two weeks after ovariectomy. So the incidence is very, very difficult to define, particularly in the United States where the vast majority of our canine companion animals are spayed. However, in some reports that have attempted to define an incidence, it seems as though we have less than 1% of dogs that have previously undergone ovariectomy of one man or another representing for ovarian remnant syndrome. Some of the reported risk factors within the literature include deep chested dogs, large breed dogs, dogs that are obese at the time of their initial surgery, surgeons who make too small or too caudal of a celiotomy, 
and then the right-handed ovary due to its cranial location within the peritoneal cavity. So as veterinarians, we certainly get a suspicion for ovarian remnant syndrome based on history and clinical signs, but generally at least one additional diagnostic is performed because after all, the treatment for this is going to be surgery and we don't wanna go rushing into another invasive procedure unless we are certain that we are dealing with an ovarian remnant. So at UC Davis, the common workup for these dogs includes an ultrasound where this is an example of one of my patients. It's an image of the left cranial abdomen. And you can see they're outlined by the two plus signs, this um, approximately 1.2 centimeter mass within the left cranial abdomen that is thought to be ovarian tissue. Uh, in human medicine, CT and MRI are more commonly used. Those have been reported in veterinary medicine, although due to their expense are infrequently used. One of the downsides to imaging via abdominal ultrasound is of course it's very user dependent um, and certainly some radiologists or some people with an ultrasound probe in their hand may be more able to identify the remnant than others can also use vaginal cytology. Some of the benefits of vaginal cytology is that it's rapid, it's inexpensive. Really the only material that's required is a cotton tip applicator and a microscope. And what you're looking for are these cornified epithelial cells. The downside to vaginal cytology is that cornified epithelial cells are only present during estrus and diestrus, and so therefore can, this test can only be performed during certain times of the female cycle. Some of the blood work or hormonal diagnostics that we can use, and these are the two that we will most commonly use at UC Davis, are anti-malarian hormone, uh, which is a hormone that is produced by the granulosa cells in ovarian follicles. And then intact female dogs have a similar level of AMH as dogs with retained ovarian syndrome. We will also simultaneously run a progesterone sample, which is primarily produced in the luteal tissue of ovaries. However, it is also a very, very small amount is also produced in adrenal glands. And so you can see based on the different tissue types that secrete these tissues, as well as the fact that progesterone is not exclusive to the ovaries, that it is recommended to use these two hormones in combination. This serum test is not time of cycle dependent, so it's very, very nice um, in that you can run it at any point. So generally we will do an abdominal ultrasound and then run these anti-malarian and progesterone serum concentration levels. Other hormones that have been reported to be um, used for diagnosis of ovarian remnant syndrome have been estrogen or estradiol, luteinizing hormone, which would be low if it's consistent with an ovarian remnant syndrome, and then gonadotropin releasing hormone. I don't have nearly as much experience interpreting these test results. They're a little bit more fiddly and a little bit more uh, cycle time dependent. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is dependent on a stimulation test. So there are then multiple blood draws involved. And so for a variety of reasons, these are not tests that we commonly use, though are certainly able to be used. So as I alluded to before, the treatment option for this condition is surgery. Um, this has historically been performed via an open ciliotomy, and the reason there's a black box next to that um, claim is that having been trained at UC Davis, I had actually never performed this as an open procedure or treated this condition as an open procedure. Ciliotomies for ovarian remnant syndrome are much larger than for routine spays um, in that you obviously have abnormal anatomy, you're looking for just the ovary, and so you really need to be visualizing kind of those deep lateral um, gutters, if you will, in these canine patients. 
So in veterinary medicine, as has occurred in human medicine, minimally invasive surgery has really become the technique of choice with regards to treating uh, female dogs with ovarian remnants. So this can be done via a three-port technique, uh, which is something that I think is very reasonable with port placements as is described for ovariectomy. A two-port technique can be pursued. It is not the technique that I prefer to use as most of these dogs do no, no longer have a proper, um, proper ligament to hook your transverse suture through your transverse abdominal suture through. So um, I prefer a three port technique where my third port can be used for a grasping instrument. For that same reason, I think a SILS is also a very reasonable technique or some other multi port platform. I think it's really important to remember that these patients don't have normal anatomy. They are going to have spay adhesions as somebody went in there at some point to remove the vast majority of their reproductive tract. Um, and therefore being able to place these dogs in Trendelenburg um, and certainly with a lateral tilt will help facilitate visualization. There is some controversy, re controversy regarding the timing of performing these surgeries. So um, it has been reported that operating dogs during estrus when their blood vessels and their ovarian tissue is more prominent may be helpful with regards to identifying this tissue. However, this is not necessarily played out in the literature and this also isn't played out um, with my own clinical experience in which um, certainly we have been able to identify the remaining ovarian tissue regardless of whether or not the dog is in estrus. So this is that same case with uh, that I showed the ultrasound image of. So you can essentially see here um, uh, the entire left ovary is in place where you would expect it to be. I'm using a three port technique here. So I'm able to elevate this ovary. You can see the vascular pedicle there in the middle um, and the uh, suspensory ligament coming in on the left hand side. One thing that is essential is even if you find your ovarian tissue on one side, it is essential to look at the contralateral side. So this is the right hand tissue being elevated, um, the mesometrium, and you can see that there does not appear to be any ovarian tissue on this side. So two ports is reasonable. This is a, this is a case that um, Dr. Mayhew sent me in anticipation for this talk. So you can see this um, ovary sitting just caudal to the kidney with the ovarian pedicle attached. He goes in with his transverse abdominal suture coming in from the top and snags some of that remnant um, suspensory ligament and then comes through and transects uh, those remaining vessels with his vessel sealing device. So here is another video of a dog that previously had a laparoscopic ovariectomy perform so just we don't think that we're perfect so here is a um, blunt probe being used to elevate the uterine horn and you can see the adhesion there down below to the uh, to that loop of small intestine so what uh, they did is they came in here again this loop of small intestine this adhesion so again abnormal anatomy adhesions present coming in and, um, with the ligature handle and dividing that adhesion and then removing that ovarian tissue. Again, he went over, took a look at the contralateral side, and this is a much more normal uterine horn without evidence of ovarian tissue at the end. So these are some of the larger papers that have looked at the incidence of ovarian remnants or have described various techniques for removing ovarian remnants. Um, and you can see that this idea of right-sided ovarian um, remnants being much more common than left-sided, although not an insignificant number of dogs have bilateral disease. So again, the importance of visualizing both sides of the abdominal cavity. 
So as I mentioned before, this has become a minimally invasive uh, surgery in human medicine, even with the adhesions and the challenges that human surgeons have. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, this idea of smaller incision, uh, less morbidity, less pain. Obviously, our human surgeons think about cosmesis also. We generally don't see Labradors walking around in bikinis, so that's less of an issue for our veterinary patients. But um, this idea of less morbidity certainly comes into play. And then improved visualization and magnification with the laparoscope. I think, again, that's probably what allows us to operate these dogs at any point in their cycle and not waiting until estrus in order to identify the ovarian tissue. So follow up for these patients includes histopathology. So it's very important to rule out neoplasia. There is an increased incidence of granulosa cell tumors in ovarian remnants. It's thought to be due to the amount of time that um, gonadotropin releasing hormone is allowed to act on, these, uh, on this tissue. And so submitting whatever samples you remove is important both to confirm that you removed ovarian tissue, but also to look for neoplasia. Um, Generally, the vast majority of our owners are excited about the resolution of clinical signs that their dog is no longer going through these heat cycles. However, we always do offer to our owners to come back within a month or a few months time for endocrine testing to ensure that their dog is in fact spayed, although very few owners actually take us up on that. So for those of you who are still studying for boards or just to really make everybody aware of this condition, because I think this is what bit that surgeon um, in, the, in the butt, if you will, um, this condition, uterine, uterus unicornis, is uh, present in both dogs and cats, and it's dogs that have uh, only one horn, so a unilateral horn. And it is generally diagnosed either at the time of necropsy or of spay. And so for the horn that is missing, the ipsilateral kidney is often smaller or more cranially located. And it is also often associated with agenesis of the ipsilateral kidney, which is the case of that dog, of that mastiff that I showed you that had the entire left ovary remain. That dog was missing its left kidney. It also, at the time of spay, reportedly did not have a left ovarian horn. And so I think maybe the assumption was, and that ovary might have been in a slightly abnormal location, that that dog also did not have a left ovary, which clearly it did. So looking at this very large retrospective study of dogs undergoing elect elective OVH, you can see that unicornate uteruses are incredibly uncommon, but among those, having renal agenesis is relatively common. So again, this is kind of one of those um, abnormal congenital or unusual congenital diseases that we rarely see, but something to have on our radar to make sure that we don't leave an ovary behind. So future directions, what I think still needs to be answered. Certainly is this more common in open versus minimally invasive ov ovariectomies? And also is a rotained ovarian uh, ovary more common in ovariectomy versus ovariohysterectomy? And I think for those of us that are training veterinary students, I think it's really, really important to think about and evaluate what we are teaching students regarding exposure. It seems like breaking down the suspensory ligament is still one of the only things that we are teaching students to do blindly or that many students are doing blindly where they're just feeling down the suspensory ligament. There seems to be this bravado amongst general practitioners to make smaller and smaller spay incisions that uh, and increase their, or I guess decrease their spay time. 
And, you know, I think we are forced to ask ourselves, is this an avoidable surgical complication? If we made appropriate size celiotomies, if we took our time, if we were certain of our anatomy, even in um, cases where there might be congenital abnormalities, could we potentially further reduce the incidence of ovarian remnant syndrome and have it so that these dogs are not going through another um, abdominal procedure and these owners are not paying for another abdominal procedure. And I will leave you with that as food for thought and I am happy to answer any questions at this time. So some of the questions I often get from our surgeons is why do a PCCL? It's cheaper, easier, and faster to remove the stones by surgical cystotomy. Breaking it down in the more traditional way um, by feel and strumming it. And then there's one more question. Um, any studies looking at complications of open approach to hysterectomy or scrotal vasectomies? I think that would be reserved for Dr. Franson. Maybe she'll be able to answer that. Yeah. It's so uh, I, I, I'll take it uh, audibly here because I was just in the act of typing another comment <laughs> about the ovarian remnant syndrome. So there are no studies at this time um, that looks at anything that has to do with hysterectomy. So I haven't been able to find anything. So as far as I know, our abstract at VS was the first with any form of evidence uh, about hysterectomies. That's my understanding. You can prove me wrong if you have heard it or seen something. All right, thank you. Um, and uh, Ingrid, thank you for that presentation. It was really interesting. I love the reminder of hormones in addition to hoping someday to see a Labrador in a bikini. That would be awesome. Um, but we'll go ahead and move on to our next presenter, Dr. Marilyn Dunn. Um, she graduated from uh, veterinary medicine at the University of Montreal and then did her internship at the same institution. She completed a residency in small animal internal medicine and a master's at the University of Saskatchewan and became a board certified um, diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine in 1999. She spent two years in private practice and then became a professor in internal medicine at the University of Montreal. She completed her fellowship in interventional radiology and endoscopy um, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in 2008. And she's a founding member and past president of the Veterinary Interventional Radiology and Interventional Endoscopy Society. And she also directs the interventional medicine service at the University of Montreal. Her interests are urinary tract and respiratory interventions and thrombosis. And today, Dr. Dunn will be talking to us about percutaneous cystolithotomy. So thank you for joining me for this talk on percutaneous cystolithotomy, and I'd like to thank VES. Sorry, one second. So thank you for joining me for this talk on percutaneous cystolithotomy, and I'd like to thank VES for inviting me to deliver this talk. So some of the questions I often get from our surgeons is, why do a PCCL? It's cheaper, easier, and faster to remove the stones by surgical cystotomy, and patients recover just fine. So uh, my answer often includes um, minimally invasive um, techniques and approaches and explanations of how those are superior, and certainly uh, a reference uh, that I use um, to help support uh, the argument is the ACVIM consensus statement on stone management, treatment, and prevention that came out in 2016. Um, the consensus statement recommended that bladder stones or lower urinary tract stones should be removed through the, mi the most minimally invasive manner possible. So medical dissolution is what is considered the least invasive um, and is primarily reserved for struvite stones that are very amenable to uh, medical dissolution. There's voiding urohydropulsion, which helps uh, remove small stones, especially in female dogs. There's cystoscopic basket removal, intracorporeal lithotripsy, 
percutaneous cystolithotomy, and at the very end, the surgical cystotomy. Certainly what the guidelines recommended is to consider all these different options and weigh um, how good a candidate the patient is for each of these options. And certainly if you get down to the bottom, uh, then surgical cystotomy is fine, um, but that other options should be considered first. I have a table here. Um, certainly we can come back to it during the panel discussion if we wanted to uh, to, to look at it again. Um, if we look at voiding urohydropulsion or cystoscopic basket removal, intracorporal lithotripsy, um, those are all um, techniques that have some size number limitations and sex and species limitations also. Uh, if we look at percutaneous cystolithotomy, um, the beauty of it is that there is no real size or number urolith restrictions. There's no sex or species restrictions either. Um, not only cat and dogs, but we've uh, performed at our hospital percutaneous cystolithotomy on um, turtles um, through the uh, celiac uh, space. <laughs> we've uh, done on um, guinea pigs, on ferrets. Um, we've done lots of rabbits also, and we've actually used it farm animals, um, including um, goats and uh, in some zoo um, species also. And so there it really is advantageous, minimally invasive, um, quick recovery and no size limitations. So to go over some of the um, publications uh, that have come out on, on the topic, there's transvestic particular uh, percutaneous cystolithotomy for the retrieval of cystic and urethral calculi in dogs and cats, 27 cases that was um, published um, in uh, 2011 in JAVMA by uh, Runge and Berendt. Uh, and they really first described the technique. Um, and that technique is, is uh, modifications of it have been published um, since then, but they were really uh, the ones who first described um, this technique. Uh, we published uh, in um, Vet Surge in 2020 a, a retrospective study of the removal of lower urinary tract stones in 68 cases. Um, we described both dogs and cats also, uh, and again um, made a little bit of a, a modification to, to what had been described by Runge, but our um, results were, were pretty similar. So very well tolerated, um, very few stones remaining, very short hospitalization times. And just recently, uh, just as of last week, uh, there was uh, Dr. Uh, Le Cavalier with Javard who presented the comparison of percutaneous, uh, percutaneous uh, cystoscopy and cystolithotomy um, to open cystotomy for urethral and bladder stones in a retrospective study of 81 cases. Um, they uh, actually showed that um, they had actually 41 cases of PCCL, 40 surgical. The anesthetic time was very, very similar. Uh, the procedural time was quite similar also, and the mean hospital stays, however, when much shorter for the PCCL versus uh, surgical cases in which the PCCLs often left the hospital um, with an average time of 8.6 hours, whereas for surgery, the average hospitalization time was 31.2 hours. Um, and certainly their uh, results are quite similar to ours, although they were they did report much shorter surgical times. Uh, our surgical times uh, at our teaching hospital are longer. We're often training residents um, and interns, and these procedures are being done mostly by internists. And so um, I think that explains some of our, our longer surgical times. Um, Dr. Javard works in a private practice, and he always has the same team um, performing the PCCLs. And I think that goes to show you that certainly there's um, experience helps uh, lower surgical times, especially the fact of not including um, un, uh, untrained individuals. Percutaneous cystolithotomy. Um, the technique I use is very, very similar to what was um, described by Runge and Berendt initially. There's some modifications, um, but the the um, I think one of the important aspects of PCCL that I found is uh, as much as possible try to get a catheter in there, um, even play around a bit, try to do some retro urohydropulsion, get the stones out of the urethra, get them into the bladder as much as possible, and I usually just do that under anesthesia once the animal's prepped in the surgical suite to save time. Um, the reason is that it's much easier to palpate the apex of the bladder and make sure your incision is at the proper location. Um, when I first started performing this procedure, um, sometimes we would open a little too cranial, um, rarely too caudal, but a little bit too cranial, and then have to prolong our incision in order to reach the bladder. Um, if it's completely impossible to catheterize the, uh, the patient because there's just too many embedded urethral stones, what I have done is just catheterize the tip of the penis and just uh, hold, gently holding off the tip of the penis and the prepuce is fill the bladder so that's nice and full. Um, 
even if we can't catheterize completely, at least we can fill the bladder up. And it's much easier to palpate the bladder and know that our incision is right over the apex. And also it's much easier to visualize the bladder. So I'd find the majority of cats and small dogs, which um, are kind of the, 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 the candidates that we um, mostly perform this procedure in, uh, if the bladder is nice and filled up, it kind of um, not floats, but it's much more visible uh, when, uh, when the abdomen's open and much easier to identify the bladder um, instead of having to go fishing for it among uh, fat and mesentery. We use a laparoscopic uh, trocar that has been previously described. Um, and after doing a um, stab incision into the apex of the bladder after here, one thing I, I forgot to mention is we do grab the bladder uh, with stay sutures, pull the stay sutures up, make sure the bladder wall is flush with the abdominal wall in order to prevent um, leakage of urine within the abdomen. And then a stab incision is done at the apex of the bladder and the port is screwed in. It's important not to make too large an incision at the apex of the bladder, otherwise it's difficult to get bladder filling um, and that decreases visibility. After that, we usually go in with a rigid scope initially, uh, look around, flush, clean um, the bladder out, remove any large stones uh, with a stone basket, and then um, explore the rest uh, of the bladder for other stones. Here's a, actually a really nice um, image of the procedure that we often use to show owners. Um, so just really um, nice uh, image of the, the trocar and, and the scope going in and the basket. Um, one of, I think, the major advantages of doing PCCL is the fact that you can gently go in with uh, your stone basket and seize the stone without um, grabbing mucosa, without um, stripping the um, mucus layer off the bladder. And we know that those are all things that are associated um, with increased bladder pain, dysuria, um, and inflammation postoperatively. Once we've cleaned the bladder out and removed all the stones, uh, if we scope the urethra, if we've been able to pass a urinary catheter, then we have someone flushing the urinary catheter and slowly pulling it out as we follow through the urethra um, with a flexible scope. Even though the catheter passes quite well in most patients, it's very, very common to see um, stone debris, to see stone fragments um, within the urethra. So certainly that's a step and that's very, very important. And some of these stones are embedded and need to be removed with the basket. Flushing is not effective in removing them. If we continue, um, these are just some of the images of uh, stone basket removing stones. Um, the bladder wall, as you can see, is almost not touched when we're removing the stones. Um, again, a combination of a rigid and flexible scope are very, very useful in order to allow us to remove um, the stones from the bladder. Occasionally, the bladder looks very ugly the bladder wall. Um, this is a um, patient who uh, had um, had, uh, had surgery actually um, prior to being presented for PCCL and, and still had a number of stones remaining in the urinary tract. So if we look at the top um, left hand corner, that is a um, bladder wall that's actually looking quite good. Uh, we're removing the stones from there. Um, and I guess what I want to illustrate with that is, is um, that when we're removing the stones, there's very little trauma to the bladder wall itself as we're, we're not really touching um, the bladder mucosa very much. Uh, the other three images that you're seeing are actually a dog that we saw um, 48 hours post-op who had uh, urethral stones remaining despite a surgical cystotomy. And so when we finish up our, our PCCLs, the bladder wall usually looks pretty good, kind of um, what the bladder wall looks like in the upper left images. Um, lots of inflammation, um, blood clots, fibrin that we're seeing within the mucosa. So, um, you know, certainly the visualization that we're able to get in PCCL is unattainable in uh, regular cystotomy. And certainly um, when I hear that cystotomy is not really very invasive, that animals tolerate it well, but looking at the bladder wall, even 48 hours post cystotomy, certainly for me reinforces the fact that I think minimally invasive procedures for the urinary tract are very, very attractive. So what are some of the um, indications or arguments to do a PCCL? Um, hopefully maybe just by looking at the difference in bladder wall um, the after a cystotomy versus a PCCL approach is enough. Um, but otherwise, I guess some of the other arguments that could be made 
certainly for doing PCCLs, um, is that there is a, a study that just came out of the uh, CVUC, which is our stone analysis um, uh, laboratory in uh, Canada. And they actually showed that in patients who have already had stones removed, so when they're, when uh, they receive second stones that are submitted for recurrent um, urolithiasis, 18% of these stones have a suture nidus. And so certainly looking at that um, reinforces the fact that with cystotomy, there, if any of you are familiar with ferrets, there's been a big controversy over the last couple of years with grain-free diets. And a number of these diets have been associated with the formation of cysteine stones that are actually quite radio-opaque um, in ferrets. So uh, we've done six ferrets so far that had a severe urethral obstruction. They have really large stones. It's very difficult to catheterize these patients. And even when catheterized, it's very difficult to um, push these stones into the bladder and in doing a cystotomy on a it can be quite challenging um, in the sense of it's very difficult to go reach the trigone and the, the urethra. And so um, PCCL and um, flexible cystoscopy has, have been um, essential in removing stones from these patients. Um, we would not have been able to do that had we not um, had PCCL. So I have a video here, I'm just to show you in a ferret, um, some of the visualization and that that we can get. Okay. Uh, so these are cysteine stones within the urethra of the ferret and this urethra actually looks quite good. We've got beautiful visualization again in areas that would be unattainable otherwise. Um, and we're able to go with the stone basket. Again, we're, we are touching the mucosa a bit, but minimally um, with the stone basket. So we're really inducing um, very, very little trauma by removing these stones. And then we slowly remove the stone, try to not snag on the mucosa at all, and then pull it out. Um, one of the things when we are doing small exotics uh, is that we do not use a trocar. Um, so uh, the trocar is just too large and causes too much trauma to the wall. And so in uh, ferrets and guinea pigs, what we have done is just made a very small stab incision, used our sutures to hold the bladder up to the, to the um, wall of the abdomen, and insert a small flexible scope and remove the stones in that manner. And surely all of you um, wanted to see a ferret peeing after this, so that's what we have here. Um, historically, goats have been known to um, be very difficult to uh, treat when they get urolithiasis. And one of the issues that goats tend to have uh, is just a very twisty, turny um, urinary tract because of their sigmoid curvature. It's extraordinarily difficult um, to get a scope into these patients. And the publications that have come out on um, trying to, to treat us these goats by minimally invasive procedures have resulted in scope breakage. And so doing a PCCL approach, which is actually quite easy because most of these goats, when they come in obstructed, get a cystostomy tube on emergency. And so when we arrive, we can actually just pull that cystotomy tube and our incision for the PCCL is already there. We insert uh, the trocar and the scope right through there. Um, here's a goat with a small ure, urolith, um, but who was obstructed. He had a cystostomy tube placed. Um, following the cystostomy tube placement, um, the stone dissolution was attempted. It did not work. And so two days after we intervened, uh, actually three days later, we intervened um, and went through the um, stomy that was uh, where these, the, the cystotomy tube was placed. We removed the tube. We passed a guide wire. We passed a flexible scope. We did a cystourethrogram under fluoroscopy, which shows um, the bladder trigone along with um, the urethra. And uh, where most of these goats are going to obstruct is in the, the urethra, just um, proximal to the sigmoid flexure. And that's exactly what we got in this goat. So we were able to perform a really nice sister urethrogram, identify the site of the stone, the site of the obstruction. Um, over a guide wire, we were able to place our flexible scope. Um, we reached the stone, which is visible there with a small blood clot and some fibrin. And we were able to actually go in there with a basket, um, remove that stone, as you're seeing here in the video. So we're removing it a little bit um, 
difficult to see, but we're removing that stone from the urinary tract. And once it was removed, the obstruction was relieved. Go and also pot belly pigs again, um, big bladder. Um, they often have stomach tubes that are placed, and so traditionally these are patients that are very very difficult to treat, um, almost impossible to treat surgically um, by using a PCL type approach that's adapted to the various species. As I mentioned, um, it really makes a big big difference. So what are some of the tricks um, that I would recommend is always pass a urinary catheter first and fill the bladder before making the abdominal incision. If you are unable to pass a urinary catheter, then placing the urinary catheter at the tip of the prepuce um, into the, the proximal urethra and do some gentle filling that way will help ensure that your incision is at the right location and that you can make a small one centimeter or so incision. Um, remove the trocar. Also, if you have lots of debris or very small stones, they're just too small for your stone basket to remove. Flush the bladder retrograde to eliminate the dust, small stones. Um, and then what you can do is with a suction, just put it through the trocar, hover over the area where there tends to be a lot of small stones and debris, um, and you'll aspirate a lot of that. You can also at the end remove the trocar and do some pretty rigorous retrograde flushing through the urinary catheter. That too helps remove as much debris as possible, which we know again in stone forming dogs, it's really important to remove as much debris um, as possible. Um, I think one of the the um, reasons that PCCL is so well tolerated that patients are so comfortable, need minimal analgesics and can go home pretty much immediately is not only the small skin incision, but as I mentioned, um, the minimal trauma to the bladder. And so most of our pain receptors are located within the trigone and the mid part of the bladder. Um, when we're doing a PCCL approach, we're really entering through the apex. It's quite fibrotic and has very few um, pain or stretch receptors. And so um, by irritating the, strep, the stretch receptors, there'll be a lot of polycuria and dysuria postoperatively. I think that explains in a lot of our patients why they're, they have so minimal uh, urinary tract signs. So even if there's some inflammation of the bladder, some damage to the bladder wall, secondary to stones, um, the fact that we're able to remove the stones without incising um, the bladder wall itself, remove the stones gently with minimal trauma to um, the trigone bladder wall and urethra, uh, I feel that that is what makes a huge difference um, along with the, the smaller incision and, and uh, less need for, for rest. Um, one thing, always scope the entire urethra if possible in some very small dogs, especially um, dogs that are under um, five to six kilos, uh, their urethra, um, at least their penile urethra is often less than eight French, so it's difficult uh, to get the scope through there. Um, but scope as far down the urethra as you can, and then you can pass the urinary catheter and flush to ensure that there are no um, small bits of, of stone or debris remaining. Um, and again, hover and suction small stones. Uh, the goal should be to not allow any stones to remain um, whatsoever. We always take radiographs afterwards, more from a legal aspect. I know a number of um, people doing PCCLs are just not taking radiographs at all, which I think are fine, uh, as long as you're comfortable from a legal standpoint, because the exploration that you have of the low urinary tract is so amazing um, that there, you're just not going to be um, leaving stones in as soon as, as you have some practice. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation, uh, that uh, you have some tricks and that um, that cystotomy will not be first on your list, that PCCL will be. I certainly have the best audience for that and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dunn. Um, that was a really great summary on PCCL and how to accomplish that technique. If you haven't already been doing that in your practice or needed some tips, there's a lot going on in the chat section. So again, make sure you guys check that out so you can read what everybody's talking about. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up to any additional questions you might have for Dr. Dunn. So if you guys have them, go ahead and ask. There's still a lot going on. Um, there's a question about discussing the laser lithotripsy part of this. Um, how often do you need to use it? Things like that. Dr. Dunn might be typing in her response at this point.
I will go ahead and remind everybody that's watching um, about the upcoming uh, VES events, the uh, Journal Club in September with Dr. Lynetta Freeman, um, the October webinar on minimally invasive complications um, with Dr. Buat, the November Journal Club with Dr. Dupre, and then in December, um, the webinar is from the keynote speaker that was supposed to be at our VES meeting this year, um, Dr. Freed. So if you guys are available, you should definitely attend um, attend those webinars when they occur. And then um, there are some member and training lecture series as well to consider in September and November. And it does look like Dr. Dunn is answering in the chat section. So um, I'll let you guys keep chatting, I guess. It looks like she's trying to talk, but um, she's unfortunately muted and I can't figure out how to unmute her. Let me see if I can figure it out, if I have that ability. <laughs> hmm. I don't see her on my list. Um, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't tell me that she is muted. Um, it does say she's offline, though. I'm not sure. It says if the speaker presses mute and unmute twice, it comes back with sound. Do you want to try that, Dr. Dunn? No, I still can't hear you. OK. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does look like there's going to be uh, continued conversations in the chat, even though everyone's muted. Um, does anyone have anything else they want to ask Dr. Balsa or Dr. Franson while we're here? It doesn't seem so. Okay. Well, it seems like the questions in the chat section are winding down as well. Um, what do you think, Dr. Thompson? Should we call it? Yeah, I think this is good. Um, thanks again thanks to again everyone to that, presented. that presented. And, and if you do have any questions, questions for Dr. Dunn or for anyone, please uh, feel free to continue the conversation on the listserv. Um, and then again, we will post the additional uh, upcoming webinars on the listserv soon as well. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for your technical help today. To all the speakers for presenting your excellent information and for everybody for attending. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Bye.